Good morning, everybody. I'm Ben Dryden, and you're watching Dryden Wire Live today, Friday, October 23rd, 2020. The election, I think, now is uh, like 11 days away. We're down to our last two Meet the Candidate guests. Next week, our final guest candidate we'll be chatting with uh, will be Representative Rob Staffshaw in Wisconsin's 10th Senate District. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, last week, I spoke with candidate Trisha Zunker in the 7th Congressional District race. And today, I'm joined by our opponent incumbent, Representative Tom Tiffany. Tom, good morning, sir. Good morning, Ben. I'm I'm with you today from the beautiful city of Superior. Superior, what are you doing up there? Oh, wait, you were oh. supposed to have a debate last night. Yeah, we were supposed to have a debate last night, and uh, the weather forecast a couple of days ago was not good, so um, there were, uh, they asked about travel concerns, and uh, we want to make sure people are safe. Yeah. And uh, But I already had the trip scheduled to Superior. I was here uh, yesterday and today, and uh, uh, making sure we're taking care of business up here in the Twin Ports, including Superior. Right. So uh, since you didn't do that, I think it was supposed to be before the presidential debate. Did you watch the presidential debate last night? I did watch the president. Yes. What'd you think? Uh, I, I didn't watch all of it. I watched some of it. Um, I thought there were a couple things that um, were really important. First of all, uh, Joe Biden made it clear that he's going to end the use of fossil fuels. So if you want to pay more for gasoline, uh, running your car, and for um, home heating oil, um, He's going to hit you in the pocketbook. The second thing is, I thought he was very disingenuous um, in regards to uh, people losing their coverage as a result of the ACA, because what he said is no one lost their coverage. That's not true. In Wisconsin here, there were 80,000 people that were on the high risk program. In other words, covering people with pre-existing conditions with a state program that in 2009, their coverage was eliminated by the ACA. There were millions of people across the country that lost their coverage. He was not being forthcoming about that. But I thought the bigger thing is just the overall tenor and tone about where our country will go in the future. I mean, Joe Biden talked about dark days ahead. And I mean, there was nothing hopeful about the message that he was delivering. President Trump was talking about, hey, we've got to deal with the realities of what is before us. And but America's best days can be ahead of us. I mean, he was invoking the positive vision of people like FDR and JFK, presidents like that, Ronald Reagan, that um, even in difficult times, they put forth a message that, you know, what did Kennedy say? Um, ask not what you can... Um, uh, country at, can do for you, but what you can do for your country? Is that it? What you can do for your country. Okay. And uh, FDR invokes similar words. Um, Reagan, of course, was always talking about mourning in America. Joe Biden wasn't talking about that at all last night. We have major challenges ahead of us. There's no doubt about it. But um, just saying dark days continue to be ahead of us uh, reminds me a little bit of Harry Potter. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I want to ask you about that. But but hold on for that. So you, I mean, clearly you are, uh, obviously you're a congressman. You, you, you see a different thing when you watch a debate. I was just rooting for two things. One, like every time Biden was talking, I'm just going, come on, President Trump, don't interrupt. That's all I would just don't interrupt. I just want to, you know, let him finish. And the second thing, I was just hoping that he was, uh, Biden wasn't going to use numbers because uh, sometimes he just gets those wrong when he starts giving all these different numbers and all these different things and he starts stumbling over himself and I'm like, don't embarrass yourself. And I think they both did a lot better than their last debate. It, it seemed like more of a debate. Uh, but I don't think it really moved the needle, the needle much. But I, I want to get back to So, yes, you did a 15 things you might not know about me, Tom Tiffany. We had it on our website uh, yesterday. And number 13, my favorite movie series is Harry Potter. I mean, 14 of those 15 things I either knew or I'm like, yeah, that sounds like Tom. That one, <laughs> I had to read it again. I'm like, really? It just You don't strike me as a Harry Potter fan. I wasn't. But I had three daughters oh. and they started reading Harry Potter. So my oldest daughter is 22 and um, she started reading Harry Potter. You know, boy, what was she? You know, eight, nine years old, something like that. Yeah. And at first I kind of scoffed at it. And uh, then the movies came out and I kind of scoffed at that, too. But then I started watching them and then I picked up the books. It is a terrific series of books. I mean, oh. it really um, to me, the greatest thing about the Harry Potter series is it 
it, it takes fantasy and imagination to a new level for kids. And I just think that's I mean, for anybody. <laughs> and for grown-ups, yeah. But I think it is so valuable in that way. It yeah. it, it, it was just a fun yeah. bunch of books. And on, on a serious note, though, I just think of the Ministry of Magic. Having spent five months out in Washington, D.C. with our federal government and the Ministry of Magic, how they were in denial for so long about Voldemort <laughs> and the troubles that big government shall bring to all of us. Nice. That's one of the analogies I take from Harry Potter. Nice. Now, I don't want to ruin it for people on regardless <laughs> of what side of the aisle you come from, putting a political spin on it. But I do think about that um, um, but, when talking about Harry Potter. But it's such a great series. All of, all three of my daughters, they probably read the books a couple times. Oh, sure. We sit down in the winter and we'll rewatch those yeah. movies they are just so yeah. terrific. Yeah, so you, it sounds like you're one of those, the book was much better people. <laughs> like, I don't read <laughs> books. <laughs> I mean, I'll just wait for it for the movie because, uh, you know, it's like it, it takes me two hours to watch a movie and I could take a nap afterwards. A book takes a lot longer. But actually, it's on Peacock right now, all the series. And my daughter, and my oldest daughter, Grace, had just messaged and said, it's on Peacock. So now we're going to be doing uh, Harry Potter. Uh, marathon, but wow, we spent probably more time in Harry Potter than I thought we were going to. I want to get back to, so that debate from last night was kind of a good segue, I guess, into what I wanted to also discuss with you. You've been doing some debates. Obviously, you're in Superior. We're supposed to win last night. You've done several uh, against your opponent. I've only watched one. I was going to watch one last night so I could kind of compare the two. Um, and I want to go over a couple of things that I had heard throughout the the one debate that I did watch. I wanted you to uh, uh, schools and reopening, I wanted you to kind of get into that a little bit. Do you believe that it's important to reopen the schools? Uh, I know that's been a, a very touchy subject for a lot of people, or a lot of people have a strong opinion about that. Where do you stand and why? Yeah, I introduced a bill. In fact, this is the first bill that I introduced um, to reopen schools, to incentivize reopening schools. It is so important that we get schools reopened. We're going to lose a generation of kids here. But I just think a few things, Ben. School is essential. We have to have a well-educated populace. And for my family, it is on, it's one of those things on the top of the list to make sure our kids get a good education. So school is essential. Dr. Redfield, the head of the CDC said back in August, get schools open, especially since cold and flu um, is actually, um, your kids have a greater risk of that than they do the coronavirus. The coronavirus has a very minimal impact on children, and we're seeing that play out in the first two months of kids getting back in school. Mm -hmm. So there's just no reason not to get uh, kids back into school. 15% of kids do not have a good broadband connection. So in other words, virtual learning is not going to work for them, and that puts them further behind. Um, and there's just a whole other variety you, of yeah, you, you, issues. Yeah, you were brought up, I, th I think it was... Uh, I don't want to misremember which debates I was watching, but I thought it was you during the the first debate last Friday night. I think you had brought up special needs as well. Special needs kids. Is um, that something I hadn't work. thought of before? I, I literally, I, my wife and I were watching it, and I'm like, I didn't even think about that. In our school district that I live in, they have a school that has kids with autism in it. And it is very clear. The teachers, all the staff, and the parents are saying the same thing. Virtual learning does not work for them. And plus, I mean, think about smaller kids, too. I mean, kindergarten through basically fifth, sixth grade. I mean, virtual schooling does not work for them. But I think the biggest issue there is that there is minimal risk for children in regards to this. They get generally mild symptoms. They get over it. And so there's really no reason not to have our kids back in school. In fact, I was talking to one school administrator up in this region who he said, if we continue this into the 2021 school year, we will have kids that will lose as much as three years of educational attainment, losing the end of the last school year, the summer slump that happened this summer, and now not getting back on board here, 2021 school year. This is really bad stuff that has long-term consequences. And remember the other stuff that's going on, Ben. I mean, you're seeing, uh, when I talk to law enforcement, increased um, drug and alcohol abuse is out there. We're seeing more depression. Suicides are up across the country. We're seeing uh, child abuse that's up. Um, some kids are dependent on getting those meals in school now. 
And there's just a whole series of things that happen that are bad as a result of not having kids in school. Mm. They need to be in school. I actually thought, because my wife and I have two kids that are, are well, three kids in school. Um, the two are in middle school. When we were going into this, we were actually considering, because uh, we had the option to do remote learning, uh, to, to do that because we didn't know, you know, nobody really knew when school started what's going to happen. Everyone was just kind of guessing, really. Um, and we were considering it, except on the form we had to fill out, it was for the entire semester. And my wife is able to work from home right now, but the issue we ran into is, well, what if they decide everyone goes back to work, then who's going to stay home and do homeschooling? Because <laughs> you don't want me teaching you, because that's not going to end well for anybody. So we decided against it, have, have them go to school, and we'll see what happens. Uh, we had just recently had this discussion about, after about two months into school, it's actually, I think, going a lot better than we either we thought or it could have gotten a lot worse, I suppose, but it's actually going pretty well. Yeah, it, it varies by school, and uh, but, but I just think at the end of the day, the proof is coming in now. In fact, I talked to the county health officer down in Newton County, Missouri. They're the only county that I found in the country where they have taken a different approach and they're really keeping kids in school. Because one of the big things here is the contact tracing, where if you're within someone, uh, within six feet of someone for 15 minutes, they knock you out of school even if you're not sick. I think this is the first time in the history of our state and country where we tell kids to stay home who are not sick. Mm -hmm. And Newton County is taking a different approach now where they send kids home who are sick, which should happen, follow your mother's advice, stay home if you're sick, wash your hands. Those are the frontline defenses. But otherwise, if you're not sick, allow them in school, but then perhaps quarantine them at home. Um, the socialization and the educational attainment that is being denied to children right now is something that I think we're going to regret in the future if we continue down this path. Something else that um, your opponent brought up during the debate that I watched, and maybe this coming up in all the debates, I, again, I only was, had the chance to watch one uh, she didn't seem uh, to be a huge fan of your Taiwan legislation. Uh, any response to that? Yeah, I was a little bit surprised by that response um, because Taiwan is a Democrat, democratic, freedom-loving country. I had a chance to go there two years ago and spend time in the country touring it, as well as meeting with their elected leaders. They're scared to death of the communist Chinese government just across the Taiwan Straits on the mainland of China. And... The Chinese Communist government under President Xi, they are bullies and they seek to dominate that um, area of the world. And they do seek world dominance here in the 21st century. And anyone that has any, um, uh, if they have any doubts about that, all you have to do is look at them skirmishing with the Indian government. They've taken over Hong Kong now, wants a free city. They have put the Uyghur minorities in their western part of China in virtual concentration camps. And I was a little bit surprised that my opponent would be critical of that because foreign policy is a critical part of what we do at the federal level, Congress and the president. I think it's really important to be engaged with these foreign policy issues. And China is the major foreign policy um, issue that we're going to have for the foreseeable future. Mm -hmm. Now, her criticism was, why aren't you paying attention to things at home? Well, I believe I can multitask because I have been taking care of things at home, including getting a couple segments of agriculture um, qualified for the coronavirus food assistance program, including the ginseng growers. They were not originally qualified. It was through the efforts of my office that we got them and the mink farmers qualified or the coronavirus food assistance program. We cut through the red tape to make sure that the Park Falls paper mill was able to reopen with a million dollar loan guarantee that was held up by federal red tape. We swept that red tape out of the way and that mill is now open and hopefully will be open now for the foreseeable future. So we're working on all kinds of issues. I believe I can multitask and I think my constituents expect me to multitask. Yeah, I think it's one of those things, though. It's kind of a, a yes, you have to uh, look at the 7th Congressional District. But there are a lot of other things that may not directly but indirectly impact not just the 7th Congressional District, but then Wisconsin, then uh, the other states. Because 
uh, I would expect that's what you're supposed to do when you're in, you know, a United States representative. It, it has to be more. You're not well, on city council, just focusing just on your city. You got to look at the the bigger picture sometimes. Yeah, I mean, foreign affairs and um, what's going on in the world is a critical part of what we do in Congress. And I'm going to be fully engaged on that. And I think my constituents expect me to do that, especially, I mean, just look at we're heavy on agriculture and manufacturing in the 7th Congressional District. Those are critical things that we want to make sure that we're able to trade with other countries. And Taiwan is one of our willing trade partners that it's good when we're able to ship agricultural and manufacturing products to other countries and be able to create jobs here in northern and western Wisconsin. So I just got a text from someone and said, where's my money? I'm assuming this person is referring to uh, the stimulus package. Hey, where are we on that? Um, so we've seen, you know, the CARES program that went through. And um, uh, the one thing that I'm advocating for right now is there are paycheck protection funds that have not been spent, $138 billion. The money has already been authorized, but the program expired as far as signing up in August. What we're proposing as Republicans in the House is let's extend that program and really target the assistance to those segments of um, our um, business and working people that really need it. And I think about the hospitality industry, restaurants, hotels, they have been hammered as a result of these shutdowns. And um, I would like to see some assistance directed to them uh, for those that have been most affected. Speaker Pelosi is talking about a $2 trillion program. and But that's really a grab bag of things. I mean, she wants to have uh, stimulus payments for illegals. She wants to bail out Illinois, California, and New York um, for their profligate spending, which, which certainly predates the whole pandemic. Uh, they've had problems before. I don't think people in Wisconsin should be bailing out Illinois for them not knowing how to balance their budget. Mm -hmm. And she wants to return a tax break for millionaires in high tax states like New York and where she lives in California. I don't think that millionaires and billionaires, uh, I call it the Bloomberg tax because he gained $160 million if this tax break was brought back. I don't think stuff like that should be in the next bill. Make it narrow, make it targeted, make sure that it's helping people through yeah. the pandemic, not trying to bail out people who had problems long before the pandemic. Yeah, and, and for a lot of people that don't know, why can't there just be uh, a bill that is signed just for stimulus for, you know, that whatever it was last time, like 1200 bucks for an adult, something like that. Why not just do that and that's it? Why does it have to have everything else attached to it? Yeah, I think that there is um, there is some interest in doing that. But I mean, let's be real clear. Um, Speaker Pelosi made it um, abundantly clear months ago that she was not going to do anything more through November 3rd. She thinks that the Democrats are going to be able to run the table in this election. They're going to be able to defeat President Trump if they do nothing at this point. She does not want to give the president a win. And that's why nothing is happening here and why nothing targeted is happening. That's why we put together the Paycheck Protection Plan extension bill. And we had Democrats that were supportive of it in the House, but Speaker Pelosi would not let it move forward. Hmm. Uh, I want to read you something. So this is going back to your debate last night, actually. And there were three things. So I signed up. So uh, all the area uh, candidates... I go to their website as soon as I hear that they're uh, going to be running for something, and I sign up for my email. And usually, like 99% of the time, these are just emails saying, here's a whole bunch of bad things about my opponent. Give me money, right? Just donate. And that's fine. Everybody does it. But last night, uh, because your debate was canceled, this is how I found out. I got an email that said, uh, this is from Zunker's campaign. And again, everyone can sign up for this stuff. It says, tonight's congressional debate was canceled due to bad weather, friend, but it doesn't matter. We know that Tom Tiffany would have just lied his way through another debate. Last debate, Representative Tiffany refused to answer questions about, and there were three things listed. One, why he voted against condemning QAnon. Two, why he is supporting a lawsuit to repeal your health care. And three, why he is refusing to criticize Trump's handling of COVID-19. Plainly, Tom Tiffany refuses to answer to the people of WIO7. And he would have done the same tonight. So if it's all right with you, I kind of want to just go through those three things. So if you want to respond to, because I didn't see your last debate, but why he voted against condemning QAnon. I think that's how you pronounce it. I don't know anything about them. Yeah. So there was two weeks ago 
um, that that bill came up. That was the very last bill we took up probably before the election. That's what Speaker Pelosi put up for the very final bill. And it did not have the force of law or anything like that. And it was purely political posturing. I went out to Washington, D.C. to do serious stuff. The day before, she put a bill before us, Speaker Pelosi did, that did not go through committee, did not go through the regular process, that had stimulus payments for illegals, bails out Illinois. What we talked about earlier, tax breaks, the Bloomberg tax break, $160 million for Michael Bloomberg because he lives in a high-tax state. That's the choice they made to live in New York and California and be in a high-tax state, and we're supposed to bail them out here in Wisconsin? She's not putting serious legislation before us. And so I just chose to vote no because I want to see good stuff come before us. The five months that I've been out there in Washington, D.C., we've been able to get some good things done in this office. We talked about the Park Falls paper mill. Mm -hmm. We talked about the coronavirus food assistance program for ginseng and mint growers. I mean, those are the kind of things that I'm working on and trying to be a serious legislator and the, rather what, than. Doing yeah. And the wolf uh, delisting thing, right? Yes. Um, yeah. My opponent was very critical of wolf delisting bill. Um, she said the Fish and Wildlife Service will take care of it. Uh, we all know what happens there. There's another lawsuit filed after the Fish and Wildlife Service delists. And we continue on this never ending game <sighs> of the wolf not being delisted. It needs to be done statutorily, and that's exactly what I did with my bill, and my, pre uh, my opponent is critical of me attempting to do that in the face of, of many agricultural groups putting it in writing that they fully support it, including the Farmers Union and the Farm Bureau, who are usually on the opposite side of issues. Yeah. They both agree on that, and they agree with me. Wow. Uh, number two, excuse me, um, why he is supporting, the, again, these were uh, last debate, Tiffany refused to answer questions about, number two, why he is supporting a lawsuit to repeal your health care. Uh, my answer was, regardless of how the uh, repeal of the ACA, the Affordable Care Act, mm -hmm. regardless of what happens um, with the courts, I have a plan to be able to get people more affordable health care. And it starts with choice, competition, and transparency. We need to make sure people have choices, more, not less. My opponent is saying, let's just have the federal government run it. Let's have competition, because competition always brings prices down. And to have competition, you have to have transparency. I have been at the forefront, both in the state legislature, as well as I will be out in Congress, to make sure people know how much pharmaceuticals and the procedures that they're going to, medical procedures they'll have, that they know ahead of time how much those things are going to cost. And so I support, I mean, here's what I support, is protecting people with pre-existing conditions. We talked earlier, the ACA went and eliminated Wisconsin's program back in 2009, which was a terrible mistake. A much better approach here now is to, whether the ACA is in place or not, Let's take dollars from the federal level and allow states like Wisconsin to create their own high risk pool, their own pool that will deal with those people with um, um, with pre-existing conditions. We will get a much more effective solution that way. I also support sweeping away, away red tape so we can bring the family doctor back. A lot of people don't realize we have something called direct primary care here in Wisconsin, and that is a fancy way of saying your family doctor from 50 years ago. And there are doctors that are just thirsting to be able to get out of the big hospital systems, not have insurance between them, the insurance companies between them and their patients, and they wanna have these direct primary care facilities. And there are a number of them around the country, uh, around the state and country, um, including right in my backyard in Rhinelander. And we should be fostering more of that primary care because for example, I have seen doctors with direct primary care, your family doctor, that will do house calls. I've seen them have rates as low as $1,000 a year. You can get all of your primary care for less than $1,000 a year. And they do that because they get the insurance companies and everybody else, all the middlemen, out from between the doctor and the patient. I think that's a really good thing. Yeah. Final thing I'd say is getting control of pharmaceutical costs. And that's where President Trump is getting some results. Because I've heard here in the Northland that 
Um, people have saved over a million dollars in the aggregate, but over a million dollars as a result of him controlling pharmaceutical prices. And I think that's another step that we can take to help people have affordable, accessible health care. Yeah, we don't hear about that very much. Mm -hmm. um, number three, and why is he refusing to criticize Trump's handling of COVID-19? So I guess what is your uh, opinion of Trump's handling of COVID-19? Well, he took the first and most important step, and it came up in the debate last night. And Joe Biden really needs to answer for this. January 31st, the president shut down travel from China. Um, it did not take long for him. When we found out on January 20th of this year, the Chinese government finally acknowledged that there was a pandemic afoot and something needed to be done. The president took action promptly. Who criticized him for that? Joe Biden criticized him for shutting down travel to China. And this president has um, authorized administratively um, billions of dollars to go into therapies, um, vaccines, where it appears getting towards the end game, where there may be vaccines that will come forth. There has been billions of dollars that have been put into personal protective equipment, testing, I mean, we do more testing in the United States than any other country ar around the world by far. This president has taken significant actions to be able to get these things done. And at the end of the day, if Joe Biden were elected as president, you just watch. He will do very little differently than what this administration has done. Yeah. And this administration has listened to the medical experts and followed their guidance um, through the past seven months. What have you heard? Because I have yet to hear that. Because I hear people criticize Trump in his handling, and that's perfectly fine if that's your opinion. Um, but I, I've, I haven't really heard of the, um, if someone else was present, what they would have done. Not like if someone's elected now, but it's, so what would you have done differently? Is it, would you prefer, I don't know, a shutdown, like the, the country kind of a thing? I mean, I just don't know what the, what would have been different? I mean, obviously hindsight being what it is, but going through all of this the first time around, this is all new for all of us. Uh, I've yet to really hear, uh, well, this and this and this. I've, I've yet to, like, I don't really know if there would have been that much difference regardless of who was the president. I'm sure there would have been some differences, but what have you heard it, about why uh, he, or what he should have done differently? It is very unfortunate that this has been so politicized. Because if you listen to the debate last night, mm -hmm. all Joe Biden talked about is 200,000 people lost their lives. You lost a loved one. Think about it. He didn't talk about, this is what I would have done differently. And right. when we look at the record, we know what he would have done differently. He would have not shut down travel on January 31st. It took him to the middle of March before he finally acknowledged, he being Joe Biden, he finally acknowledged there was a problem with China. Think about how many more cases we would have had if travel would have not been shut down for another month and a half with China. It is so easy to second guess. But the greatest concern is that Joe Biden is talking about, he's talking about having lockdowns yet of the economy first of our lives. Mm -hmm. And even the World Health Organization, a month, uh, excuse me, a week and a half ago, they said the lockdowns need to end because these broad-based lockdowns are causing more harm than good, what President Trump calls making the cure worse than the disease. Mm -hmm. Joe Biden's made it clear he will try to find any way possible to shut people and uh, to shut our economy yeah. down if he thinks that's the best approach to take. That can have equally, if not greater, harmful effects mm -hmm. on all of us, these broad-based lockdowns. And we're hearing it now from medical experts from the World Health Organization. They're saying, don't do these lockdowns. It's a really bad idea mm -hmm. because the harm is going to be far more than the good you're trying to create. Well, one of the questions that I had, actually, I think it was my wife that brought it up, <clears throat> excuse me, is uh, when you compare, uh, l let's say there was another president, let's say Biden was in office, or let's, it doesn't matter who was the president throughout this whole thing. Uh, again, what does that look like? Would we have a vaccine by now if it was a different president? I don't really see how that those things are kind of connected. Maybe they are, but I don't really see how. But how do we evaluate how someone is doing? Is it just by total deaths? Is it uh, by by uh, 
vaccination or um, um, testing. I mean, how do you really evaluate how someone is doing? And that actually transitions to the last thing I want to talk about, which is Governor Evers' mask mandate, the 25% limit on bars and restaurants. But if you look at Wisconsin, uh, we were uh, pretty aggressive in kind of in that forefront or progressive when we did the safer at home. Um, we now have the, the, the mask mandate, the 25% limit at bars. So a lot of people look at Governor Evers and say well, he, he did a lot just from this standpoint, just from COVID, not, not, not about all the you know, other stuff that, that may tie into it, of course, like businesses maybe having to shut down, et cetera. But our cases are still going through the roof and deaths are just climbing like crazy. So it, when you look at it, so, so was Governor Evers, was that good? I mean, how do we evaluate how someone did when the numbers are still going up? In Wisconsin, and Wisconsin did a lot of things progressively. Sure, um, happy to address that question. So, when Governor Evers did his original two-week shutdown, um, I agreed with that. I was like, we needed to evaluate where are we and where should we go from here. As we got into April, though, I think it became more clear um, who we should target. And so, first of all, I would just say to all of our frontline healthcare providers, thank you. Thank you for the work that you're doing. And also for all of you out there, remember what your mother said, stay home when you're sick. It is really discouraging when I hear about people still going out when they're sick and they'll go in a bar. And I've heard of people going into a bar wearing a mask, even though they're sick, and they're saying, well, I'll protect people because I have a mask on. That mask is no guarantee. So stay home when you're sick, wash your hands, and then in regards to the um, 25% requirement by Governor Evers in regards to bars and restaurants, I, I think we should allow for a regional targeted approach on these issues. Take a look at the city of Milwaukee. You know, they're not complying with the 25% regulation with bars and restaurants. They um, are allowing a little greater capacity because what they said is we're going to make other efforts in different ways to be, able to, to be able to make sure that we protect people. And I think that type of approach should be encouraged. Mm -hmm. Allow local communities, locally elected leaders, tribal leaders to be able to create their own program for their region, for their local municipality to reflect the needs that they have. But um, um, it is very clear that the lockdowns need to end and we need to use education. And that's the one thing I would encourage Governor Evers at this point. He's a former teacher. He knows education is always better than to dictate. And there's frustration by people that they're being dictated to here rather than being educated. I would encourage Governor Evers, get out of Madison, travel around the state, encourage people, do the same thing that I'm doing now where I say to people, and this is what I do, socially distance, wear a mask, Wear a mask where it's required. I always carry one with me and wash your hands. As a former restaurateur, I know how important good hygiene is and do those primary things. And that's going to help everybody to be able to get through this. I, I can social distance. No problem. I prefer that, actually, uh, just staying away from people. Uh, wearing a mask, no big deal. I always have one in my backpack or one in my vehicle. I, I don't go that many places. The washing the hands thing, I've still struggled with that. It's just not something I just randomly think about. I mean, I don't know. I, I'm pretty hygienic. I shower like once a week, like clockwork, like every Saturday. Uh, but when it comes to washing my hands, man, I'm not kidding. There's times where it's like, I don't think I even wash my hands once today. I'm like, ah, so I go and wash. It's just not something I normally think about doing. Uh, but yeah, it's not really that tough, right? Just put a mask on and social distance. It's not that difficult. It, it's not. And that's the primary defense that we have. No doubt about yeah. it. And I think part of it, you know, like when we look in... Uh, uh, in northern Wisconsin, especially the district that I represent, I mean, people are talking about, boy, there's exploding cases and it's all the rest. And the cases have increased. There's no doubt about it. And there's concerns out there. Um, and we need to take this seriously. The virus is real. But you also have to remember that we started with very low levels um, throughout the summer. And, you know, it appears it's our turn. It's a virus. It is going to go through the population, and we want to limit it as much as possible, but it is a virus, and it will affect people. Well, there's 11 days left to the election, uh, well, obviously your election, well, and the president, I suppose. Uh, uh, pretty much everyone's made up their mind, right? You're not going to really change anyone's mind at this point, most likely. So why don't you just take like 11 days off? 
Um, I disagree. I think there's a significant number of people that are still making up their mind. And I think about being in the barber shop yesterday. How would you like my haircut, by the way? Uh, well, very nice. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, but I was in the barber shop yesterday, and um, there was a guy in there that he said, you know, I still haven't decided who I'm going to vote for uh, for president. I actually think there's a few more undecided people than uh, than you realize. And so the final 11 days is really important. I mean, that's why I'm up in Superior. I was here yesterday. I'm here today because I'm covering every corner of the district. District. Now, I'm doing it responsibly and safely. I'm doing it social distancing. I make sure and take the appropriate protections. But you know what? I was elected to represent over 700,000 people. And it's important to do my job that I was elected to do. And I will continue to do that, including going out and meeting people and sharing with them some of the good news of stuff that we've been able to get done, but more importantly, a future vision for this district and for America of how we can get back to prosperity. And I start out by saying, restore, rebuild, and reopen. Reopen safely and responsibly. If we do that, we're gonna rebuild our economy. We're already seeing it come back from the depths of a few months ago with the mandated shutdowns and lockdowns. And I think we can restore the, uh, our way of life and renew the American dream. Those are the things that I'm going to be working on. I'll just take 11 days off, but okay. You can do you, man. Yeah. <laughs> we'll be out there. Yeah. We'll be out there and, and, work. Uh, uh, so we're up against the... Uh, yeah. Uh, anything uh, that we uh, uh, didn't get a chance to talk about that you wanted to discuss or bring up or say? Gosh, um, I hope to earn people's vote again. Um, I can't thank people enough for the privilege to be able to represent them for the past five months. And man, we've been able to get some good things done. And we have a priority list, whether it's broadband, up here in Superior, trying to get Navy contracts for private shipyards, um, uh, continuing our work on the agricultural front. Um, there's just all kinds of things um, that we have on our list in my office that we're going to be ready to go to work immediately after November 3rd, having a, uh, a real impact benefiting Northern and Western Wisconsin. It's been a great honor and privilege to be able to do this for five months. I really look forward to doing it again for another two years. Well, best of luck to you on uh, November 3rd. Blessings to you and your family, and uh, thanks for being here. It's great to be here, Ben, and uh, enjoy these 11 days off. Yeah. <laughs> You've been watching Meet the Candidate on Dryden Wire Live. I'm Ben Dryden. Until next time, stay safe, keep your social distance, and as always, have a blessed day.